Digital family as well. We had an incredible time last Sunday night at our Sienna campus. Sienna staff, you did a great job putting it all together for us and everybody else that was involved, production team and everybody, just a big thank you. It was amazing to be able to see God at work in that way to be there from all campuses gathered together. And we were able to give our advanced commitment is what that was. Some folks were ready to go. They knew what God wanted them to do. They were excited about it. And so they had their card and they were ready to drop it in and to go for it. Now, don't worry, the rest of us are gonna have that wonderful opportunity in November 14th, so just two weeks away, praying and asking as we've been journeying on this Kainos journey to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts, lay on our hearts what He wants us to do. It's a God-sized task. We're not gonna be able to get, just get this done by, well, I'm not gonna eat donuts a couple weeks. This is a we're going for it type thing. Students involved, kids involved, parents involved, single adults, senior adults, everybody involved. All of us jumping in for a God-sized task. So my message today is called the joy of generosity. The joy of generosity. Kainos being the new word, being a new word saying in Greek new. So what I want you to do, I want you to grab your Bibles and turn to First Chronicles chapter 29. First Chronicles chapter 29 is where we're gonna be. And in this, we're going to see the journey that we have here. Let's see here. I, for some reason, they're asking me to download um, Adobe and I don't need to do that right now. Now I'm on my outline. Okay, we're ready. So we're going to look at this kainos, meaning new in Greek, and we're going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, and I want you to turn in your kainos book as well to page 86. So remember what we're doing for these weeks. You got a kainos book on one knee, you got a Bible on the other knee. That's where we're going. So kainos book on one knee, Bible on the other knee as we journey through this, looking at this. This is exciting where we're going. Now, as you're getting there, let me remind you what your book is filled with. We've got three buckets of what we're trying to accomplish what we want God to do through us. The first bucket is the commission. Then we have our community. And then we have compassion. So I want us to say these three things together. You ready? Say these three words, all campuses, digital family as well. Count of three, one, two, three. Commission, community, compassion. One more time. Commission, community, compassion. Our commission is the Great Commission. That's our normal church budget. This is a Kainos initiative for two years. Our normal church budget for two years will be $63 million. Think of the impact we'll have with that. Thousands of things we'll get to do, amazing things we'll get to do in impacting lives. Our community is, the big three chunks of that, is we're gonna build a worship center and some other uh, buildings in our Siena campus. We're doing really great down there. Lots of people coming to the Lord and coming uh, to church as well. So we're gonna build that in our community, in our Siena campus. At the Loop campus, we're gonna build in with the lawn at the Loop. We're gonna redo the lobby. We're gonna do some stuff with our students. We're gonna do a lot of things around the Loop campus. It's gonna be great to do that. We're also gonna expand our digital footprint for our digital family. We've all watched church online at some point, but to be able to get it even expanded to reach more people, um, we're reaching about 163 countries online right now. 9,000 hours a month of YouTube videos being watched from our church. So it's an amazing thing what God's doing. We wanna do even more of that. We've done a lot at Cypress and downtown already. So we're doing it at Loop in Siena to do that. Our compassion that community is gonna be about 20 million. Our compassion is going to be 10 million of being able to translate Bibles, help missionaries, plant churches, help declining churches, help with adoption and vulnerable children, see new ministries birth. It's gonna be a great thing. Your book is filled with all these things. So we've got an exciting two-year journey ahead of us of commission, community, and compassion. I want you to show, I wanna show you biblically where we're gonna see this aspect of giving. Now, when you talk about generosity, you talk about giving, there's a, a tendency for people to go, oh no, oh no, oh no. I want you to think, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. The name of the message is the joy of generosity. Not the burden of generosity, not the, oh, I got to of generosity. There's never been a message in Christianity ever preached called the joy of selfishness. Never happened before. Not gonna happen. But the joy of generosity. Look in verse six of First Chronicles 29. This is David providing, we've been studying the life of David, David providing for Solomon to build the temple. Verse six. Then the leaders of the household, the leaders of the tribe of Israel, tribes of Israel, and the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, 
and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. So you got leaders at home with the leaders of the household. You got leaders of Israel and the government. You got commanders of the military and you got officials in charge with the government as well of the king's work gave willingly. Next verse, verse seven. For the service of God's house, they gave 185 tons of gold, 10,000 gold coins. There were some that could give gold. 375 tons of silver, some could give silver. 675 tons of bronze, some could give bronze. And 4,000 tons of iron. Here's what I want you to get. A key mark of leadership is generosity. A key mark of leadership is generosity. That verse six is stating that the leaders of the households, the leaders of Israel's tribes, the leaders of the military, the leaders of the officials that are in charge of the governmental things, that generosity is a key mark of leadership. See, God wants to work in our hearts with generosity of time, of attention, of resources, of money, of being able to have that. Why? Jesus speaks a lot about it in the New Testament because he knows it grabs our heart. Young parents, let me tell you this. Here's a word you'll never have to teach your kid. Mine. There's never been a parent with some Cheerios laying them out on the tray going, let's say mine. Say mine. Now we work on mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and Jesus and Bible and, you know, brother, sister. All the, We work on those all the time. Please and thank you. If you're a parent, you're going to work on it forever is what you're going to work on it, Okay. Just know it. It's going to be like, they're going to be 22 and you're still going to say, say thank you, say please, okay? And it's going to aggravate them at that point, so don't do it, okay? But it's going to take forever. But you'll never have to teach the word mine, will you? Why? Because it's natural to us to do this. But what does God want us to do? He wants us to do this. And so the mine of our resources is very natural, very defensive posture. But the give, the joy of giving is very open and saying, Lord, I want to be a leader and leadership is marked by generosity. See, influence requires sacrifice. Influence requires sacrifice. To be a leader, and you are, you're a leader in your home, you're a leader in your workplace. Students, you're a leader in your school, you're a leader in your neighborhood, you're a leader in your marriage, you're a leader in your family, whatever it is, God wants to use you to influence people. And leadership is influence, and influence requires sacrifice. Amy Carmichael, the missionary, I gave you this quote last week, but I want you to hear it again this week. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You can give without loving. I mean, you'd be like, okay, Pastor, you're talking about this. Here's 10 bucks. Fine, 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 fine. But you can't love without really giving. And a leader sacrifices as a parent, as a leader of the organization, whatever it is, there's a sacrifice that comes. And we all have a place of leadership in our homes, our church, our life, our businesses, whatever it is, our schools. Leadership, secondly, on this is a combination of credibility and influence. So he says, here's the leaders of the households. Here's the leaders of the tribes. Here's the leaders and commanders of the military. Here's the leaders that are official. And there's a combination of credibility and influence. Now, just a little side passage here. In the United States of America, in a lot of different ways, we have a problem because we have leaders with influence that don't have credibility. So they got a lot of influence, but we kind of go, I think you're lying to me. They got a lot of power, but we think they're a cheat. They got a lot of this, that, and the other, but we think they're immoral. We say this and they do this. Leadership together is the combination of credibility and influence. And that's why our primary goal of this initiative, Kainos, is about the heart. That's the primary goal. It's not about giving. It's not about money. It's not about projects. It's not about that. It's about the heart of the people of God, seeing the vision that God's given us in his heart and then following his hand as it leads. So it's about your heart. I want you to turn, if you will, to page nine of your book. Turn to page nine, way back in the beginning. I want you to see this with your eyes. One of the first pages that we have here of page nine, we lay out our primary goal is 100% engagement, a new level of surrender, a new level of faith, a new level of generosity. That if God gets a hold of the heart, we get about the heart of God. God gets a hold of our heart, guess what'll happen? 
God's hand will move in a great way and he'll be able to use us in a tremendous way. So 100% engagement. We're asking for our staff to be 100% engaged, our deacons to be 100% engaged, our life Bible study leaders to be 100% engaged because we wanna have the credibility and influence together to then take it to the church to say, hey, we're in. Kelly and I have already turned in our commitment card. We've already given a first fruits gift actually as well. We are all in because I don't wanna tell you to do something I'm not doing. And so God puts together credibility and influence and makes a game changing moment. And you know what that requires? That requires humility, requires humility. We love to talk about in today's world, servant leadership and being humble and, you know, that uh, sports players should be humble and celebrities should be humble and all that. That's really a very Western Christian mindset. If you were to go back into history, when Jesus was on planet earth, you would find that basically you had the Greeks and you had the Romans and their way of leadership was not humility. With the Greeks, it was a high philosophy and the teachers, and they would stand in their certain places on the stoa, where the Stoics would be. It's called, it's, it's a Greek word for porch. And they would stand there and they would teach. And that was how you did it as a Greek. You would teach in your philosophy and your wealth and your wisdom. That's what made you a leader. And the Romans were military conquerors and they were gonna go in and they were gonna pound their leadership into you. That's how they were gonna do it. And then Jesus shows up and he says, better it is to serve than to be served. I've come to, to, be, to serve, not to be served. I'm gonna wash feet. I'm gonna ride the back of a donkey. I'm gonna have no place to lay my head. I'm gonna have a, a, a poverty aspect of it, of walking through. He's not gonna have any military aspect. He's not gonna have this great uh, wealth. And Jesus is gonna turn the world upside down. Why? Because he didn't say mine. He said yours, God. Your will be done, yours. Here's the deal. You'll either be humble in life or you'll be humbled in life. You'll either be humble in life or you'll be humbled in life. We choose to bow our knees instead of having life bow our knees for us. The word tells us every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will be a humbling moment at some point. I wanna begin on my knees. I wanna crawl in on my knees into heaven type of thing. I wanna be humble, not be humbled. And these leaders here, they're generous. And we see with the leadership of Jesus, with the heart, it's all about the heart, turns things upside down on its head. Look at verse eight as it continues on. In verse eight, we get a great verse of scripture and I'm gonna show you verse eight. Then we're gonna jump down to verse 14. Verse eight, underline it in your Bible. Whoever, underline the word whoever. Whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the Lord, to the treasury of the Lord's house under the care of Jehiel, of Gershonite, of, of Gershonite the Gershonite. And the people rejoice, verse nine, it goes on. Now look at verse 14. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as gen generously as this? for everything comes from you. And we have given only what has come from your own hand. So it says, whoever gave to the Lord and that they gave only what the Lord has given them. Here's the point. We give from what we have been given. We give from what we have been given. What has God given you? How does the Lord bless you? Well, God didn't bless me. I, I go to work every day. Oh yeah, God didn't give you that mind. God didn't give you that hands. God didn't give you that heart. God didn't give you that job. God didn't give that. Well, let me tell you, brother, you're on your way to getting humbled. It's a whole lot better to start humble and say, Lord, you have given me the mind. You have given me the education. You have given me the opportunity. Lord, you put your hand on some things. Who in the world? Then you up at verse 14. Who am I, Lord, that I'm able to give to you? because you've given to me, wow, incredible, amazing. We give from what we have been given. God asks you and me to give of what we have, not of what somebody else has. You ever thought this? You know, if I won the lottery, if I got a million dollars, if I was rich like him or her, you know what I would do with that? I'd do all these other things and I'd be so generous and give that. You know what? Statistics actually show that's not true of the human heart. Money just reveals who you already are. More money just reveals who you already are. And so to think that if we had what somebody else had, God's not worried about what somebody else has. God's talking about what you've got in your heart. What's your heart? And we have this thing as humans, we gotta watch it. Our income and our, ex, uh, our, um, our spending and our income seem to just kind of keep going up together. Let me ask you this, you driving the same kind of car that you drove in high school? No, you got this kind of car. 
Live in the same kind of house you lived in in college? No, you got this kind of house. Go on the same kind of vacation you went on before? No, we just let our income and our, our, um, our outflow begin to just raise together. So you can have millions and millions of dollars and still be strapped for cash. How in the world do we see professional athletes and celebrities go broke? How does that happen? I know if I made $15 million a year, that'd go well for me, right? Just give me one year. But somehow it reveals the, the, the frivolous spending that's always been there. And the same thing can happen in the same seat of our heart. Why? Because we all say mine, don't we? But freedom comes when we say, Lord, it's yours. Different gifts, but one heart and one goal. We're able to say, Lord, we just give it to you. All of us have different gifts, but we have one heart and one goal. So it's a God-sized task that we have before us. So all of us, if everybody jumps in in obedience to the Lord, then the Lord will do great things. But church, I want you to know, we usually just blow things out of the water when it comes to generosity. But I don't want us to get lackadaisical. Let's keep pursuing God and say, Lord, we need you to speak to our hearts in a great way. Different gifts. Everybody's different. You don't worry about somebody else. You walk with God in your own heart, in your own life. There's a book that I read this summer. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much. I almost made it the church read for this semester. But then I thought, no, we got enough information coming at us. You're learning Greek words like kainos. And then we've got books that you got to flip through hundred pages of stuff to see all the things that we're doing. So I said, I'm not going to do it. Okay. So you didn't have to read this book. It was awesome to, to read though. I enjoyed it. It's called The Seven Money Types. I don't know if this has happened to you before, but I walked into a bookstore. Um, we were actually on sabbatical time at that point, And I saw this book, Tommy Brown. I don't know Tommy Brown. I had not heard of Tommy Brown but I really enjoyed this book. And I just felt like I'm supposed to read that book. And I walked away and I said, no, 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 no. And then I walked, I went back to the store and I bought the book and I got it and I read it. It's an amazing thing. What it does is it takes seven different biblical characters and puts a money personality type with each character, okay? So Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, David, Moses, on it goes through. So I'm a, if you read the book, I'm an Isaac and I'm a David. That's what I discovered for myself, okay? Let me tell you about the David in here. Why? Because we're studying the life of David. So what is the money type of David? David is bringing in all of this, this, this gold, silver, and bronze, and iron, bringing it all in to build, to let Solomon build the temple. We don't call it David's temple. We call it Solomon's temple. Look at page, or not look at it, you don't have it, but listen to page, sorry. Look at the, that. I'm gonna read you something, here we go. This is about David. The next generation remains a top priority for David types. So while they charge ahead towards their goals, they're always reaching back to the younger generation to bring them along. David types may have come from humble beginnings. Perhaps they were often overlooked or ill-equipped by most people's standards, but either someone gave them an opportunity to succeed or they overcame the odds and rose to the top. Remember, David's king now, he was a shepherd, least of the, the shepherds even, uh, the youngest one in his family. So David types pay it forward, making sure the next generation does not start from financial scratch. True leaders leave a legacy to the next generation that they can build upon. David types set up the next generation for financial success. So what does a David type do? A David type, and we've all got a bit of this in us. David types are like, what can I do to set up the next generation? I wanna pay it forward, so to speak, and be able to do that. Now, if that's not like the beat of your heart, that's totally cool. It's, there's a lot of other types in there, but it should be a bit of our heart as believers. So I, as a David type, I love doing things like this. This is gonna build the church for decades. This is fun. This is incredible. I love thinking about how I can help my children. I love being able to see students sing in worship. I love being able to see the next generations comes up. I got a David heart in me that loves to see that happen. Now, David's often begin from humble beginnings, not always, but humble beginnings. I remember in college, a girl that um, I was friends with, she said uh, her trust fund at 21, she just got her trust fund. I said, man, that is cool. And she said, well, you got one. Your parents just didn't tell you yet. She said, everybody's got one. Your parents just hadn't told you yet. And I was like, I don't think I got one of those. I've been paying attention for a lot of years and my mom is a school teacher, right? I, I don't think I got one of those coming, you know? And so far, it hadn't shown up, okay? 
But I want to be able to give back to the next generations and see them come. There's a joy of generosity. And whether you're that type when you read the book or not, it doesn't matter. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just trying to tell you why David's doing this. He's doing this because he loves Solomon. He wants to see the kingdom of God go on. We get to give to the next generations and build the church for decades. Wow. It's awesome. It's awesome. So how does that happen? It happens by every buddy giving with one heart and one goal, but different gifts, different gifts. Let me give you this example. We get, I told you a couple of weeks ago about a prisoner that donated to our church. Do you remember that? He tithed, sent us a check for $9. We got another gift just this past week that was pretty incredible. We'll show you the front of the generosity card. We crossed out the name and such, but $2, $2 cash. Now flip it over and you'll see a note from a homeless lady that our church helped. And she said, I wanna help and give back. Here's what she wrote. Homeless, trusting the Lord to provide like only you can. Help me keep my eyes on the one true God, not on my problems in Jesus' name. As you provide, instill in me the desire to give to you freely, Lord. Is that incredible or what? $2, a widow's two mites to be able to do that. After the first service, she came walking down. I didn't know she was here. And she said, I'm the lady that gave you that note. And I just wanted you to tell you what an encouragement that was to me. And I said, can I just give you a hug? And we just stood there and hugged. She said, I'm living in a tent downtown and this church has helped me. And I wanted to be here on Sunday morning. No clue that I was gonna share this as an illustration. And I said, you know what? Your $2 may be inspirational for literally millions of dollars. She gave what she had. Now yours is far more than $2, I, I bet to be able to say, I wanna give and I wanna sacrifice and I wanna be a part of that. So how are we gonna do that? How's that gonna happen? Turn to page 66, if you will, in your book. So how do we take this joy? How do we take this, yes, we want to, how does this become a reality? Last week, we introduced the generosity staircase. And I just want everybody to know the buckle down, the wheels are tight. Everybody asked, they were worried I was gonna slip. No worries, we got it. The first step is an initial giver. We're hoping and praying that literally hundreds of you that do not give to God's work through the church, that you would be an initial giver. And let me just say, by the wayside, students, young singles and young marrieds, get this right now and you will find great blessings in your life. It's hard to do it as you go along. And I'm sure I could get a big amen, but I'm not asking for it. It's hard to do it. The initial giver is a courageous, exciting first step where they say, you know what? I've never been a part of kingdom work. I, I'm giving a dollar here and video made me cry and 20 bucks here. But I mean, I'm talking about real giving, going for it. I'm in, signing my name to it. Let's do it. That's a courageous first step. And we will celebrate that in a tremendous way. That'll be awesome to be able to see that. Then to step up an intentional giver. Intentional is planned and prioritized. This is where you say, you know what? I get a paycheck on the first and the 15th and then I give a percentage out of that. Kelly and I've always found a great blessing in tithing of giving 10% and we get more than 10% now. But when we first got married, I can remember paying bills, writing checks in those old days. And I'd come out of the, the study, the little back bedroom we had with a little desk and she'd say, we're gonna make it this month. And I'd say, I don't know, it's gonna be close. And I'm in it, it was gonna be close. And you know what? God would provide God would provide in an amazing way. So an intentional, planned and prioritized giving. And some of you, you know exactly what you need to be doing. You're just not doing it. And the joy of generosity, jump in, jump in, go for it. Trust God, let him do his work in you. I know some folks will say, well, I don't wanna do a commitment card and I don't wanna be you know, so rigid of all that. Well, let me tell you what, you sign a commitment to your mortgage, you sign a commitment to your rent, you sign a cell phone contract, you got a cable TV bill. You got all these things you're signing your name on all the time. And you won't say before the Lord, you got me, God. And I'll trust you, God. And you lay something in my heart and we're gonna get it done. If we got to cancel cable to get it done, we're, get, we're doing it because we're going for it. And some of us spend more money on our phones than we are on the kingdom of God. And we've got to have an initial, or excuse me, an intentional aspect. It's give, save, spend. That's how you have financial freedom. And when you flip it around to spend, save, give, you'll never have financial freedom. See also broke athletes. 
Give, save, spend, intentional about it. Nothing good happens, it's not intentional. Surrendered giver. Surrendered giver means that, that giving drives everything else in your life. Your debt doesn't drive everything else in your life. Your doubt doesn't drive everything else in your life. Your discouragement doesn't drive everything in your, else in your life. Your giving drives everything else in your life. Give, save, spend. So that's the first thing that's gonna happen. I'm giving. And then we're gonna figure everything else out from there. That's gonna drive everything else in your life. What if you got to a place, what a crazy, awesome goal this would be, where the largest check you wrote every month was generosity. If the largest thing you gave was given to the Lord, that would be incredible. At least beat your cell phone and cable bill. To allow the Lord to do something great and you prioritize and you say, this is a surrendered thing. It's not mine, it's yours. And then the last one, and I'm sure we could go 10 more, is a lifetime giver. This is where it's a legacy aspect. They're gonna talk about it at your funeral. You wanna Preach it to your grandkids. You want to talk about it with your kids. You want this to be a hallmark statement of your life, that your lifetime made this huge impact through your generosity. What an incredible aspect that is. So what is God asking from every single one of us? Simply this, take a step. Take a step. Where are you on the journey? Take the next step. And when you do that, you know what you'll find? You'll find the joy of generosity. The joy of generosity. And if it's a homeless lady with $2 or a prisoner with $9, somebody with X, Y, Z dollars, whatever it is, you'll have a giving heart. Now look at verse nine. Watch the joy that happens in verse nine. The joy of generosity. Then the people rejoiced because their leader's willingness to give, for they had given to the Lord wholeheartedly. King David also greatly rejoiced. There's four words in there I want you to see. Joyful, willing, wholehearted, and inspirational. Did you see them? Joyful, the people rejoiced because of their leader's willingness to give, for they had given to the Lord wholeheartedly. So we've got rejoiced in willingness and wholeheartedly. King David also rejoiced greatly. He was inspired as well. A giving heart is joyful, is willing, is wholehearted, and is inspirational. When you give, it inspires me. Do you know right now we have had hundreds of people already turn in their commitment card to say we're in it for kindness of something new of God wants to do. I hope that encourages you. It encourages me. When you give, I'm encouraged to give. When I give, you're encouraged to give. It's awesome to be able to see that build itself out in that way. To do that, there is a joy produced in others. Even the giving gave joy to the king. When you give, I'm inspired to give. When you give, I'm inspired to give. When I give, you're inspired to give. So that is an inspirational, wonderful moment. Now, last place I want you to turn in your book as we look at this God-sized task. How are we gonna do this? What's, a, what's some framework? What's some help? I've tried to give you a framework of the generosity staircase. Let me give you another one on page 64 of your Kainos book. Page 64 of your Kainos book. That's the commitment card that we'll turn in on November 14th. And we'll all wear our Kainos shirts on that November 14th, all campuses. Digital family, we want you to participate as well. And so what we'll do is we'll figure out our little lines on that card, the first line there. What will we normally give to Houston's first in a year? That might be a challenging number. You're like, ugh, I kind of feel bad writing that down. Hey, don't let guilt drive this thing. You walk with God, write it down. What's our expanded generosity gonna be? Multiply that times two, put it in that next little blank. Maybe there's some stored resources that you wanna give from. That would be great. And then your two-year commitment. Church, let me tell you why we need this. We don't wanna go spending money without knowing the church is behind it, right? We've gotta be able to know and to blow this out and to go for it and to make all this happen. We gotta know everybody's with us to be able to go forward. And it's a God-sized task. It'll require all of us to jump in 100% participation. Look at uh, page 65. It gives you a little chart where you can look and find kind of a number. What is it that, that would be kind of your number in there and pray about that? It's just a guide, just a guide and of how many gifts we would need in that to reach our goal to be able to do that. So it's just a guide of being able to do that. But there's a giving heart that happens 
that we're able to start our hearts with generosity and say, Lord, we want you to use us. So we, what we do is we wrap up. Are you an initial giver? Is it time to become more intentional in your gifts? Are you really surrendered and it's driving your life? This is a great, joyous place to be. Is it a lifetime aspect of the legacy of your life saying, God, I want you to do something in me? And let me tell you what, the joy of giving is incredible. It's wonderful. It's great. It's mighty. So in thinking about the joy of generosity, I want to close because this is a fun thing. I want to close with something a little different than what we typically do. Tonight's going to be a lot of people getting a lot of candy, okay? So kids, as we wrap up, a lot of kids are going to get a lot of candy uh, this evening. And so I wanted to just give an illustration using candy. So this Monday, I thought this through, got my creative juices going, and I wrote out a little paragraph using about 25 different types of candy for us to have joy in our generosity, okay? So I want you to journey with me. I want you to laugh with me. I want you to go with me as we begin to wrap up. So here is the joy of generosity put in a framework of candy. Church, I'm your pastor and you are my peeps. (laughs) God desires us to live in symphony with His will as we trust Him to connect the dots in our life. Generosity can be a difficult subject since we are all butterfingers with our money and it makes us feel like an airhead. But walk in faith. Your impact is not based upon a bigger payday or another hundred grand or finding a sugar daddy. So don't be a dumb dumb and don't be a nerd thinking that your generosity will require that thinking that generosity should wait on extra income. You don't have to live on Fifth Avenue to honor the Lord. You may even be in a crunch. You may have hit a sour patch in life. So if that's the case, take five and remember that God orbits the Milky Way. He has seen every starburst and he will provide for your every need. He can take a life that is in Reese's pieces with zero in your wallet and give you mounds of almond joy. Before you know it, you'll be a Jolly Rancher again. So listen to your pastor and be a smarty and realize that following Jesus is more than a whatchamacallit in life, that he is the ultimate lifesaver. I give you all that to say there is a joy, taste and see that the Lord is good and that he can provide sweetness in your heart where there's sourness has been. And you just say, Lord, it's yours, and I give to you. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We ask, God, that you would speak to our hearts and our lives. Do your work in us, Lord. There's no doubt of desire, but it may take a little bit of work to move through those fears and to really put a pencil to paper and think about, now, how are we going to do this? Father, we want our students to be involved. We want our kids to be involved. We want senior adults. We want everybody, Lord. This is everybody. And so we ask you, Lord, that you, God, would speak to our hearts and our lives. Lay a number on our heart. Lay the next step on our heart. Show us what we need to do. Tell our spouse. Help us to lead our kids. We'll never have to teach them the word mine, but we will have to teach them the word give. And Lord, no one has given us more than you. Everything we have is from your hand. Most importantly, you gave us Jesus. 
who died on the cross, who came to serve and turned the world upside down with his humility. And we just come in Jesus' name. Speak to your people, God, and those who don't know you as Savior, may today be the day they receive the sweetest gift of salvation. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.